Yeah, so and I'll be talking about different kinds of economic coupling gaps uh, and about the work that we've been doing in these systems. And I uh, first wanted to introduce sort of my research group. So, uh, most of these two gentlemen who are doing all the work, uh, to the extent that we have now come to more permanent job in the University of West, West Virginia, and uh, Brian Anderson, uh, who is a student, a very good student, who is looking for a postdoc, by the way. So remember his name. Uh, now, uh, this is the outline of my talk, uh, maybe a little bit unrealistic, because I wanted to talk about many things. And so first I will start with sort of a general introduction slash motivation for studying spin transfer in solids and solid state systems, and it will be a little bit unconventional approach to this. And um, so then I will try to explain some um, recent experiments, or well, maybe not so recent experiments, where people have observed uh, different types of uh, spin-dependent effects in nervous coupled systems, and uh, uh, I will emphasize two things. So the first will be that in clean systems where disorder is weak, so the spin accumulation occurs due to uh, uh, edge states that are uh, spin-dependent, and in disorder systems, so the physics is described by uh, 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 spin diffusion equation that we can be able to derive, and so there is also this theory have been recently verified by the group of um, Joe Rinstein in Berkeley, and received some potential in the media. So and then in the end, actually, I will move to uh, the, what I was supposed to talk uh, officially uh, to spin orbit coupling effects, which were actually realized in cold atom systems. And uh, so this will be a sort of uh, completely different physics, but with the same Hamiltonian. And the, the major difference will be that in solids, we're dealing with the difference which are fermions. But it turns out that in cold atoms, you may uh, get essentially bosons, which have an effective spin one half. And uh, spin orbit coupled bosons uh, behave very interestingly. And this will be the last part of my talk. So um, this is a sort of review of what spin orbit coupling is, and so the simplest uh, way mathematically to introduce a spin orbit coupling is basically to write a single particle Hamiltonian, which includes the kinetic energy term and the spin orbit coupling term. Let's say first, let's think first about two-dimensional system where P is uh, has just two components, and so the spin orbit coupling term that actually exists in real materials is sort of uh, momentum dependent Zeeman field. So you may think about it basically the Zeeman field, which depends on the direction of motion of the particle. And uh, there are uh, several standard forms that this spin orbit coupling field may uh, assume. So uh, the most popular one is so-called Rajba coupling, when this uh, uh, Zeeman field is proportional to T cross Z. So if you have a two-dimensional system, there is a, an axis perpendicular to it. And so this field is T cross Z. And this arises due to the lack of mirror symmetry. For instance, if up is different from down, you will get if you have a substrate, let's say, uh, or different types of contacts on top and on the bottom, we will get this Rajko uh, term, which uh, for some reasons that I'm unable to explain actually have been the only term mostly studied in, in theory papers, but there are definitely are the terms which uh, exist, so including a uh, very similar term which is called Dressel uh, uh, House coupling, and uh, so it's just difference in, in the form where it assumes, and it's due to the, the lack of other symmetry in the, in, in, in the crystal. So also uh, later in the talk, I'll be mentioning um, I'll be mentioning so-called persistence spin helix uh, point, which is basically uh, a spin orbit coupled system when the Rajba coupling is coefficient alpha is equal to the linear Dressel house coupling, and uh, there is an interesting symmetry which arises in this persistence spin helix uh, regime, and you can actually uh, see it already here. So basically, what's what's the importance of this uh, spin orbit coupled Hamiltonian is that it doesn't commute to the spin. Normally, spin is a good quantum number, so you can basically have a double degenerate band. But if you have spin orbit coupling, so you can uh, pick any Pauli matrix. Since the Pauli matrix is not commute, commute spin is no, no longer a good quantum number. And so what happens is that the original uh, double degenerate quadratic band splits into two subbands, uh, basically corresponding, let's say, to the chirality or some other quantum number, which is no longer a spin. So the spin texture is actually uh, unusual. And uh, so this particular, for instance, this particular band structure is uh, specific to the Rajko model. And what's important, and I will emphasize it in the following slide, is the existence of the crossing point, the degeneracy point where the two bands uh, cross. And so this actually point has important mathematical consequences and physical consequences on the behavior of the system. Just for completeness, also let me uh, mention a three-dimensional spin orbit coupled system. So essentially, spin orbit coupling exists in most semiconductors, let's say in gallium arsenide, it's not anything new. So the normal is described, let's say, in gallium arsenide with this type of Hamiltonian, where J actually is an effective spin three halves in cold open semiconductor. 
But the bottom line is that uh, so the couple system is essentially a, a Hamiltonian a system with a Hamiltonian that has a coupling between momentum and the spin-like degree of freedom. Now, I mentioned this degeneracy point in the spectrum, and let me kind of uh, explain, maybe in a little bit unusual way, why it's very important for the physics that I want to, to describe. So, and the explanation goes uh, like that. So basically, I have to go back to usual single particle quantum mechanics and recall uh, standard very phase effect, which is as follows. So uh, imagine you have a Hamiltonian, which depends on the, on the parameter lambda, which is which can be whatever, uh, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter what the physical uh, realization of this parameter is. And let's imagine that we are able to change this parameter in real time, let's say adiabatically. And so uh, uh, let's imagine that we change this parameter in such a way that we start from a certain point uh, and uh, after this adiabatic evolution return to the same point in the parameter space. So in principle this parameter space lambda doesn't have to be three-dimensional space, but it could be three-dimensional space. So what happens is that the wave function, the wave function, the single particle wave function as a result of this evolution acquires a phase which is now known as the Perry space. And interestingly, and this is important, this phase can actually be calculated as a flux of a fictitious magnetic field through the uh, area enclosed by this loop in the parameter space. And uh, so this is not a real magnetic field. It's a sort of uh, a concept. Uh, it is something like magnetic field, and it exists in this parameter space. And what is even more important for the, uh, for the physics that I want to describe is that it turns out that the sources of this magnetic field, or if you want the fancy word, the monopoles, are degeneracies in this paper. Uh, the simplest example I can give you is, for instance, if you consider the Zeeman the spin Hamiltonian, which is basically H is equal to minus B dot S, where B is the real magnetic field. So B equals zero is a pretty degenerate point. So Hamiltonian is equal to zero. So this degeneracy in this paper plays the role of, an, you know, of a source of the magnetic field, which, in turn, would induce this, uh, this uh, quantum Phase. And this was, in fact, in the original paper of Michael Beer. Now, what does it have to do with uh, spin orbit couple systems? Uh, let me explain. So, it actually has to do with any multi band system, so a system in which you have more than one uh, band. So, imagine that you have, for instance, block states in a crystal, which are characterized by some block wave function labeled by some index M, which is the band index. And so, these block wave functions uh, depend on uh, the quasi momentum in this crystal. So, this uh, vector potential, or you know, the curl of which will give you the magnetic field, can be calculated for each band uh, as follows. So this is basically the product of u n of p, d over dp, u n of p. So this will give you uh, a certain object, which is uh, a vector labeled by the, by the band index, in which depends on the momentum. If you now calculate this, the curl of this vector, again, in momentum space, you will get some sort of a magnetic field. And it's not just sort of it's not just a mathematical <coughs> construction. Uh, it, in fact, it uh, it has serious physical consequences. Uh, and uh, for example, imagine that you have a, again a multiband system, and you consider the motion of a wave packet in a certain band. So uh, you can just write the quasi-classical equations of motion for the wave packet, which normally would consist of the statement that r dot is equal to the derivative of the spectrum, which gives you sort of the velocity. And this is nothing but you know the real the usual Newton equation, this is a real magnetic field, a real electric field, a real magnetic field. But in the presence of the degeneracies in the spectrum, in the presence of this sort of, uh, you know, I call it dual magnetic field, dual because it exists in the in momentum space. So there appears a new term in the classical equations of motion which uh, modify the notion of a velocity. And this is called anomalous velocity. So in fact, it was first derived by Karpus and Lattinger back in the 50s. It, of course, they didn't call it a uh, very phase but they had all the equations right. And uh, only recently it was sort of emphasized in this new language by Sundram and New and by Haldane, uh, um, well, already, you know, 10, five years ago, and who showed that, uh, you know, this anomalous velocity is really associated with this mathematical structure and, uh, you know, it's, uh, and that uh, the degeneracies in the spectrum uh, are playing an important role. And also, I won't actually go into great details, uh, actually in any details about uh, interesting generalization of this concept, but there are some, some interesting works, uh, like in particular by Murakami et al, who showed that there are so-called non-abelian fields, when B actually becomes a matrix for degenerate bands. So Balianz and Shinto showed that there are some similar structures which look like an electric field if you have interactions. So there are all kinds of the generalization of this, but one line is that there is an interesting effect 
uh, which is related to this sort of mathematical structure. Now, again, an important observation is that all you need to produce a anomalous velocity is the generating the band structure, which you always have in a spin orbit coupled system, so with no exception. Because you have to split the, the, the quadratic band, and uh, as a result of this, you will get a degeneracy, and immediately you will get uh, uh, the DCP. And so this was actually realized by Murakami et al., uh, who uh, looked at the spin orbit couple system. In, in their case, it was a Leitinger model, model uh, called the semiconductor, but it doesn't really matter, actually, the particular uh, model. Well, it doesn't matter that much. And what they found is that. Uh, Indeed, you know, the degeneracies in the spectrum of the model lead to a magnetic field that I just described, which looks just like a monopole field, in fact, in momentum space, which is actually very neat. So, you know, you see it's basically it's P over PQ. It's proportional to P over PQ. Very good question. Yes. We're going to get all this uh, now to Nagoja school. I'm sorry? This uh, uh, now to Nagoja? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. I'm sure you start to recollect the number. It's a science paper, actually. Uh, I guess it's a... Uh, it's a rather famous. Uh, uh, right. kind of story. To ask right. I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah. So it's a science paper, and there have been many other papers. I just picked there, you know, one uh, which I, you know, it's a random choice in some sense, but it was one of the first. That's why. And so uh, the, uh, you know, another interesting thing is that you get this uh, monopole structure, which is very neat. And, and so the basic idea is that, well, you have this dual magnetic field, which uh, leads uh, to anomalous velocity, but, you know, usually you, uh, you know, the usual rest force would be B cross uh, V, right? So here you have B cross P dot. Well, that's why it's dual. And uh, P dot you can have only if you have an electric field. So if you have an electric field, it's non-zero, so you have an non-zero field. And they realized also that in spin orbit couple systems, so the bands actually are built out of uh, different spin states, and so they have different spin structures, and so the existence of this anomalous velocity will lead to some spin-dependent effects and, well, spin accumulation. So would the magnetic field be the same as the electric field or what? The same in what respect? Oh, you have to be both. Well, ma magnetic field, uh, magnetic, if you're talking about real magnetic field applied yeah. to a sample, yeah, it would lead to real, you know, Lorentz force. Right, right, right. So this guy enters sort of, let me just go back maybe, uh, it's not very intuitive, perhaps. So, you, uh, if you try to describe again the motion of a wave packet in the band, so normally you would just say, well, my velocity is d, d epsilon over dp. That's it, period. Okay, I never go back to this. But what I'm saying is that there is another true. Mm -hmm. It turns out, which looks exactly like actual Lorentz force, with the difference that it's p dot instead of r dot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, and there is no like electric charge entering here. So it's actually a purely topological effect. It also doesn't really matter how far uh, the, the generous thing is. It can be very far down, and still you will feel it, basically. And so the statement is that, well, if you, for instance, if you, call, if you take the Kubo formula and calculate some linear response that you believe is related to spin uh, currents, which actually is a uh, sort of the most, in my view, is the most controversial part, because spin is not conserved. It's not clear what to call a spin current. But still, you can define a sensible quantity uh, let's say, uh, you know, sigma v anomalous plus v anomalous plus sigma, so, and uh, calculate basically the current, which you call a spin current, and you will find that indeed, uh, in this case, it's going to be non-zero. So basically, you apply electric field, you get spin accumulation at the edges of the sound. And so this was a prediction, and the conjecture was, you know, that indeed this, uh, this happens. Okay. But this is spin hole effect, right? This is what was called spin hole effect. Yeah, question. Uh, yes. Shouldn't there be a similar effect if you apply, say, a spatially varying magnetic field that you get a charge current? Yeah, so there could be, I think there, there even have been works, works along these lines. I'm not mm -hmm. Because there you don't have a problem of defining the current. So, right. in principle, uh, there is nothing wrong with the usual spin poly field. It's just one has to calculate the right one. And usually people are calculating a linear, linear response of some spin current, which is you know taken out of uh, loops. You can define an infinite number of Hermitian operators and calculate linear response. Because the question is how do you how do you how you should interpret you know the linear response coefficient. So uh, so it, it gives you the right intuition about what happens. But you know to describe things quantitatively, you really have to calculate observables, which are spin densities of the edges. And this can be done, in fact, that's what we did. So can you also have spin noise effect? Right? Yes. Oh. So, so you have an anomalous. So the spin is all the same direction when it accumulates on the edge. 
So I will actually show you an experimental uh, curve, or not curve, but experimental picture, which will clarify things. So also, since I want to mention some of our work, so we also realized in our work, so this is what's actually our work, uh, the source of the spin accumulation was a little bit different language where we, we didn't involve uh, spin currents, but instead we calculated the observables <coughs> in, in, in the theory. So, uh, and the calculation is really conceptually very simple. So you take basically the model that you like, in, in this case it's a uh, uh, you know, Leitinger model, so this is some spin, well in this case it's spin 3 half, this is the momentum, and just we calculate, we, we solve the Schrodinger equation, single particle Schrodinger equation in the presence of a boundary, which models you know, the edge of the sample. So, um, um, just to remind you, if you remember about the cold dope semiconductors, in the cold dope semiconductor, you have two bands, uh, both the double degenerate, one is called heavy holes, and the other is called light holes. And uh, in simple words, what happens uh, in the presence of the spin orbit coupling and the boundary is the following. So, normally, if you send a quantum particle towards the boundary, a plane wave, let's say, it reflects at the same angle, uh, you know. Uh, and the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. But if you have multiple bands, what happens is that if you send a particle, let's say, in the heavy hole bands, it reflects in all other bands. Not only as a heavy hole at the same angle, but also as a light hole at a different angle. And there exists a critical angle at which the heavy holes are not reflected at all, and you just get a localized edge state, which, however, is hybridized with the ball. So, uh, and we found that in, uh, those edge states are actually the states which are contribute to the spin accumulation. So, uh, there's an interesting analogy with optics here, actually. So, if you imagine that, well, you have two bands, and one band lives in the upper part of this, uh, you know, uh, plane, and the uh, you know, light, light holes live in the lower part of, uh, of, of the plane, you can imagine uh, that, so basically, uh, the process of reflection depicted here is really includes reflection and refraction into the other part. And at some critical angle, there is a total internal reflection when uh, you know the uh, beam doesn't propagate at all in the other part. So th this uh, process that you get in the spin orbit couple semiconductors, in fact, is very similar to what you would get in an optical system uh, in the process, you know, uh, a total internal reflection. But the only message here is there. The next slide includes some complicated formulas. Just ignore them. Uh, so the bottom line is really here: is that uh, so the uh, uh, these localized edge states carry uh, non-zero spin, and if you have, for instance, more uh, states propagating to the right than to the left, let's say due to the presence of an electric field, you will get spin accumulation, which is what is observed. And also a side remark on this is that in topological insulators, actually similar things happen, but you just don't have any bulk states. So topological insulator is the state basically where you only have the localized modes, which are not hybridized with anything. They're just pure uh, protected modes. But here I'm talking about a metallic system where there is no gap. Okay, and so you can actually calculate, you know, the, you know basically spin density. And then the intuition uh, is the following. Yeah, so what I'm calculating is, uh, so this is the boundary of the system, and this is the actual spin density as a function of the distance from the boundary and an applied field. So, you know, if you put any boundary, any perturbation in Fermi gas, Fermi liquid, you always get three oscillations of different kinds. Uh, for density, those oscillations, if you integrate over them, they will uh, you know, average out to zero because the density is conserved, the number of particles is conserved. So, however, if you integrate over the spin density here, you will get a non zero result, which you actually can call spin accumulation. This is observable. Here. So, it's only at zero temperature, right? Uh, what is it? Otherwise, we will oscillation. Well, they're a little bit down. No, no, they'll be strongly down because it's T over psi. Sorry, the. It's, it's T over T naught, and T naught is uh, actually very small. T naught being? Uh, it, it, at at non zero temperature, you multiply it by e to the minus T over T naught. Well, I would say that I divided by hyperbolic sine of T over 2 pi e here. And if you are, or something like that, if Fermi enters there. So there's nothing else. It's, if you take a normal Fermi gas with a circular Fermi surface, there's no other length scale or energy scale. There's no T naught. There's T here and T here. That's it. There should be consistency, right? So we go to higher temperature. Well, I mean, I this, this is a zero temperature equation. We have included temperature. Yeah, those two. But, but, but you will still have the spin accumulation. You lose the oscillation. And the spin accumulation at high temperatures, and you lose the uh, oscillations, uh, is like it's more classical interpretation of the spins moving in most directions, hitting the boundary. Sorry, uh, sorry, that's not, it's not, uh, it's e to the minus 
z divided by psi, and psi is each, each term velocity divided by Ah, you mean spatial oscillation? Spatial, not yeah, well, it'll, be, it'll be strongly down ah, okay, okay. this way. So, uh, well, first of all, I haven't done uh, temperature calculation. In spin orbit couple systems, maybe a little bit more difficult. To, I don't know, basically. So in, in the usual, in the no, usual. It's not. Case, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's the same. Yeah, yeah it's, I, it's, it's, it's really tied to how sharp is the Fermi surface right. Yeah, and right. you smear it, and, and, it's there, the, and its oscillation disappears. But the only way to smear it is by thermal effects. So right. T over E here yeah. is the only parameter. No, 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 no. It's e, e to the z minus psi. That's what is psi? Psi is h Fermi velocity divided by 2 pi t. And if t is small, then ah, uh, so I'm sorry. This psi that I introduced, I'm sorry. I just it was I was not I was not actually. Don't say it's really important. So this uh, no this psi in this point point case point. is just the ratio of the mass. So uh, it's uh, light poles versus you know heavy poles. So in the, in the presence of a temperature, normally any faded oscillations or Reiki Ky interactions that I'm familiar with are usually suppressed by exponential of. It will still be left with a positive t. Yes, yeah, so there will be something. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You damp the rest of the temperature. Yeah, of course, the temperature is going to be suppressed. Yeah, I guess when you go to the test machine, the question is really about the spin relaxation time, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. For, versus uh, your accumulation rate. Yes. And I guess you assume that the spin uh, relaxation time is kind of infinite. So this is a green system, so okay. it can be completely infinite because otherwise if you uh, apply an electric field, you know, it doesn't really make sense to talk about transfer, just yeah. accelerating definitely. So you need some relaxation. In some sense, this is a, a picture that you get at a uh, length scale smaller than the mean free path. So it's a sort of clean result. And the only reason I mentioned that is because just to show that the result actually comes from the edge states, which, you know, connects it somewhat to the, those, you know, those of you familiar with the logical insulators. So this, in fact, is relevant. Now, these are real experiments, which actually, uh, none of them are relevant to clean systems, by the way. So these are all very disordered systems, and this actually is the two dimensions. What kind of highest temperature? Uh, yeah, these are rather, uh, well, it's not a huge temperature. But, uh, so, um, there is a question. Could there be oscillations in these experiments? I think that's I'm that. sorry? Could you see these with oscillations? No, really, okay. Uh, so, uh, so because actually, it's too dirty. Yeah, so this is different physics, which I will describe later. Okay. So, but this is the actual experiment. Yeah, I know So, uh, and the experiment of the group of the uh, Dushalam and, and Santa Barbara and what the, I'm sorry, is this? Yeah, I think it's. So, uh, and you apply, no, there was a difference. Uh, so you apply an electric field uh, in this direction, and so these red regions and blue regions are uh, direction of uh, the spin. What is the surface do? I'm sorry? What is the surface? So this is a uh, gallium marcinite uh, two-dimensional heterostructure. So this is the surface you do, you show us. So yeah, so this is I think a pure rotation measurement. So basically they can measure the I see position and I see position. Mm -hmm. Which is x box axis and which is the y well, axis. I mean you which label it the way you want. You know you want you can so Z you Z you have into the bulk, right? So that was your definition of Z into the bulk. So this is x y plane. So x y electric field. Okay. So spin up, spin down, uh, up and down, being like that. Okay. So and you see uh, clearly that there are some there is some accumulation. So what I've heard is that this experiment is sort of the best of uh, the data they see. So they all not all, they don't always see it actually, and uh, it's very hard to do this experiment. And moreover, it's not clear that actually it's related to. You know, this electric field is this way. Yeah. So this way. That way. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so again, uh, you get uh, this uh, this effect without an applied uh, magnetic field. That's sort of what was uh, interesting. Uh, but you have a, you have a, you have a spinorbit coupling which breaks at uh, this end. So this is one of the experiments which has been done on. Uh, Wait, go back to that picture. Yeah. So that that that's the magnetic field being measured on the edges. Well, spin polarization, it's a pure measurement. So there's no, I mean, because if you have spins sort of accumulating on each side, don't you have like a magnetic field and gradient going across the sample? Well, uh, maybe you do, but I mean, uh, it's uh, again, so there is also uh, there is also spin orbit coupling, which you, uh, 
it's different. It's di okay, if you want to say that it's not equilibrium structure that should relax somehow for something else. It's, it's a stationary state. It's a stationary it? state, which is. Or is it a story? If you like an electric field, it's much more like this. Yeah. You push a current like that, yeah. and then you get the spin current like that, it, it passes against the wall. Yeah, right, and then because you have spin relaxation rate, it's like you produce. I mean, you have the continuous case, and you get a stationary state. But you have the you con your, the current's continuous. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can run the current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you have don't wouldn't also just have a magnetic field itself generated at the edges? Well, it's still a dimensional system. Maybe there is a magnetic yeah, field. Yeah, there is. Now you have polarization of which field. Yeah. There's tapping on top of the field. So it's exactly you care, right? You cannot see this as normal. So, uh, make sure that I understand what I'm doing. so electric field is in this direction, yeah. and the spin for the blue in which direction is? So I would say it's a, you know, spin is three dimensional, and the system is two dimensional. So let's say spin is in this direction. Uh, it doesn't right. make sense because right. the gradient of z is in that direction, and you need you see the three vectors to be orthogonal. So I suspect that right. spin right. is probably up or down. Like that. No, I think you see the z's in the direction like yeah, this exactly. way. It's, it's exactly this way and this way. This way. But, uh, it depends on the spin orbit coupling, in fact. So it, 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 it should be perpendicular to the gradient of density. And the gradient of density is in the other I remember it. It is also a classic spin all types in. Actually, yeah, you break it first. So this is the z direction, this electric field, and the spin should be in this direction. You have an electric field. They're yeah, responsible yeah. for But the mirror seems to be broken here, so it's not. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's so the, the rule is the electric field that produces the orbit coupling is perpendicular to the plane. Electric field is. It's no, yes, no, it's no, 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 no. This is what you said. No, you. What do you mean? Does it feel wrong? No, I know this. I was there. So, okay, okay, so what are you saying? You have a curve. So for this orbit coupling, you need an electric field. Okay. So you drive an electric curve, which for which you also the need an electric field, field. That, that causes a blown electric curve, right? And that causes a spin curve like this, where the spin orientation has to be perpendicular to both the field through the rest of the plane and the rest of the curve. So you have the spin in this white plane. Right, so one, one thing to mention though is that... We know that, this exactly, uh, otherwise I'll explain it to you also. Right, so it's actually not a theory picture, it's an experimental picture. They have no idea what exactly the spin orbit coupling was. It can be a mixture of this and house and Rajma. I think they do the same thing, right? Basically, huh? they do the same spin all the time. No, the effect is the same, but it doesn't. The effect is not specific to Rajko model. Yeah. It, it will be it's a basic power model yeah. or a mixture of those. So, uh, the, if you have any spin orbit coupling, you will have an effect. Yeah. And uh, well, but the problem is that in experiment, they actually don't know what their spin orbit coupling. All they know is that if this mirror symmetry is broken strongly, so Rajko will be enhanced. And if the width of the heterostructure is, uh, you know, depending on the width, you will adjust the three house. In fact, that's what I want to show now. It's basically, the first now is playing on all numbers. Right. So there was also another experiment by um, Joe Orenstein's group in Berkeley uh, who uh, did the following. So they, uh, using some um, spin grading technique, uh, which is basically an optical technique to inject a spin density wave into a semiconductor to some degree. So uh, they observe basically spin relaxation in, in a two-dimensional spin orbit couple semiconductor. So they well, shine light and do some magic with these mirrors. And uh, as a result, you know, they get uh, beams with different polarization, which act on uh, the system and produce a spin density wave. So if there were no spin orbit coupling, the spin density wave, so the spin is conserved. The spin would have been conserved. But uh, in the presence of spin orbit coupling, the spin is not conserved. And what they see, they look at the relaxation of the structure and uh, they can measure spin relaxation rate, which is actually very important, and it characterizes uh, both the spin orbit coupling and disorder strength. So and this is one of the early experiments uh, of uh, also David Oshalom, uh, who was also uh, Joe Ristin. So the, what is plotted here is the spin, basically uh, uh, the uh, amplitude of the spin density wave as a, function of, uh, as a function of the distance from the injection point and the C oscillations. Uh, and also they've seen uh, similar oscillations as a function of time, in fact. So not only the uh, spin density relaxes, that is, you know, dissipates basically, it also oscillates, and this is something which actually uh, was not understood properly in the beginning. So, uh, because normally diffusion doesn't involve any oscillations. So, and now let me actually go to the theory, since I'm giving a review, so which involves, which involves spin relaxation and disorder in the systems, which is present in all real experiments. And so this will be 
sort of uh, a picture uh, qualitatively describing what's different in the presence of disorder. So um, let me first present a kind of qualitative picture. So as I, as I, as I said, for instance, uh, spin orbit coupling field is essentially a Zeeman field which depends on momentum. In the presence of uh, Rajba coupling, this uh, field is perpendicular to the momentum. So this is the magnetic field, spin orbit coupled field, this is momentum. Now, the spin uh, of the electron actually processes around this field. And if it were to move, you know, ballistically without scatterings, it would just process indefinitely and, well, it would, be, would have been conserved. But in the presence of disorder, what happens is that the momentum changes and so does the spin precession axis. It also changes. So, the, uh, therefore, the spin processes around the randomly oriented axis. So, if you imagine a block sphere on which the spin, spin leaves, so basically start processing, you know, around a randomly uh, oriented axis. At some point, you know, it diffuses away from where it was originally, and this is the mechanism for spin diffusion, essentially, which is called the Atenaferial mechanism. And you see that actually momentum relaxation is uh, essential for the presence of this mechanism. So that's what happens, actually. And uh, in certain parameter regime, basically when this disorder is relatively weak, that is when this information <coughs> occurs after many scatterings, you can use a uh, diffusion type equation to describe uh, the behavior of the spin densities. So uh, normally diffusion equation looks like that. So there is some density, some diffusion coefficient, or by a of density. <coughs> but here I also have to write uh, a relaxation term described by this process and some other terms which actually exist, and they're pretty complicated. So uh, any questions about this? Um, so, question? yep. Uh, so um, why don't you have to use a matrix equation for diffusion equation? Why, why, why what? Why don't you have a matrix equation? I don't have a matrix, it's just a qualitative picture. So that's exactly what we use. <coughs> well, let me actually... So ignore the technicalities. The only thing I want to say is that it can be derived. The diffusion equation, as you just said, is a matrix equation. So what I'm interested in is the density uh, of the spin and charge. So uh, and in principle, it is labeled by an index A, which can be 0, x, y, z, 0 response to charge, x, y, z to x, y, and z components of the spin. And, well, this can be done using the diagrammatic technique, technique or kinetic equation. Basically, there are means to derive it. So, and there is some kernel that you expand and do some uh, approximation, uh, which is basically a long wavelength approximation. And in the leading order, you basically re-derive the usual diffusion equation. Tau is the scattering time, D is the diffusion coefficient, and mega is what will give you the derivative with respect to time. So the left-hand side is something that you would get always uh, for any type of a diffusion. But there, is also, there are also terms which are rather complicated, which uh, you know, involve uh, different components of the spin. So they involve relaxation processes, they involve spin precession, and they involve uh, spin charge coupling. So for instance, if you drive the current, or not is the density of charge, so you, you can induce spin currents. And so every, all these terms are important, and they have different structures. And so that's basically what we did. <coughs> we derived uh, the spin diffusion equation, as you said, the matrix for an arbitrary reasonable uh, kind of choice of uh, spin orbit interaction parameters, which involves uh, linear uh, Dresselt House and Rasper terms and cubic Dresselt House terms, which are basically the only terms normally present in the real material. And so here is the explanation. Remember the data which showed some oscillation, oscillations as a function of time uh, for uh, the densities. So normally, if again, if you are dealing with the usual diffusion of, let's say, charge, so uh, this is uh, an inverse diffusion operator, d over dt, and d Laplace and Fourier transform. So if you want to see how the charge diffuses as a function of time and distance, you basically Fourier transform this Green's function of the diffusion equation, and this is the Gaussian type result that you would get, which doesn't have any oscillations whatsoever. So it's the usual kind of uh, result. However, if you are dealing with spin charge coupled diffusion equation, what you have to invert is a complicated matrix, which involves all kinds of couplings between the spins. Uh, it's not impossible to do, it's difficult, but we, okay, it can be done. And what's, what's important is that, unlike here, where you have just one pole, where uh, you know, uh, I and M is equal to D2 squared, here you have a, a 4 by 4 matrix, which you have to diagonalize. You have different types of eigenvalues, which some of them could be complex. And if you get a complex, uh, complex part, it would lead to uh, oscillations. Okay? Right, so this is rooted in a non concentration of spin currents, I think. I'm sorry? Right, so normal diffusion is about how the number of variables, the things don't get lost, right? The spins get lost in the spin time. So it's still, hydrodynamic, it's still hydrodynamic in the following sense that we are looking at the system at the distance is much larger than the uh, uh, spin relaxation length. There is a characteristic distance at which. Yeah the um, particle has to travel to forget about its spin direction. Yeah, yeah, look at... And we look at larger distances. Yeah. 
Yeah. But the existence of one or a DAO is yeah. crucial. So, so the question, yeah, exactly. So the question is like, you get the uh, uh, sort of imaginary part in the diffusion because of the spinalization. And it would all be conserved to it happen. Now, I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure actually, I have to think about it because it, it's a really complicated matrix. You diagonalize the matrix, sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. Actually, there are different regimes yeah. even that you get. In fact, we, that's but what Normally, it. normal uh, conserved entities wouldn't have to produce yeah. oscillations in the Probably not. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, if you can, you see it is very different, then you can. Like yeah. in two diffusion coefficients are very yeah. different, you have two very yeah. different scales, and then you can get oscillations. Yeah. It is very same. I know that the right distance that you consider. It's called, it's called, spin it's called, it's called, not exist, right? It's, it's called Turing instability. Yeah. But, but here, the real difference is that spin curves are not highly dynamically conserved. But then now you have an interesting the whole system yeah. and then uh, you still have signals yeah. in the right distance. Okay. And so, yeah, this sort of explains uh, the presence of, okay, we found this mode for, and we found that it could change, uh, you know, sign such that it becomes uh, a complex number. And it explains qualitatively the existence of oscillations. So there is a spin relaxation time in this. Huh? There is a spin relaxation time. So spin relaxation time is related to uh, basically momentum relaxation time and the strength of the spin orbit coupling. Yeah. So it's but in your uh, equations, I mean, everybody can recognize there is spin non conservation. So it's, uh, it's really, it's, uh, it's, uh, so uh, it's some uh, dimensionless point, right? So there is, if you want to write the uh, general solution to some differential equation, you know, diffusion equation, so you would get these relaxation modes, okay? So and there is, you know, minus i omega. So if this i omega has, uh, you know, real part, in this case, it corresponds to relaxation, and so they can be found for this particular, for a particular model. But also there are corrections which are momentum dependent. And, and since they are injecting a spin density wave, you know, wave has a wave vector, so you really have to look at the relaxation in a particular wave vector, such that it can become, you know, a complex number, and it would translate into, you know, oscillations of the spin density. That's so important. But also on top of that, there will be kind of relaxation. And this is uh, the paper that we wrote a long time ago, I actually forgot about it for some time. So this is a phase diagram, if you want, in terms of couplings. So I'm not going to go into great detail, but there is a Rushford type interaction, and Dresden House type interaction, everything sort of collapses into two parameters, and there are different parts of the phase diagram and different colors basically uh, classify states that you get. Some of them oscillate, some of them have two oscillation frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. So you get qualitatively different types of uh, behavior depending on the parameters. And so we very, very carefully have investigated that. We found, you know, some kind of uh, diffusion coefficient, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually forgot about the paper until recently where uh, there was an experiment which verified that. It actually was even covered in physics today last April, and uh, there were two, actually three things which were written up uh, by in the search and discovery uh, section of the physics data. So one was actually this persistent spin helix, spin relaxation actually, which was explained by our model. Also the second part was the logical insulator, so I'm so it was all kind of bundled into a single article, which was called exotic spin texture shop and diverse materials. But the reason we actually were mentioned even in this context was the following. So there was an experiment of, uh, Again, mostly it's uh, the work of Joe Ernstein, but also David Dushalong was involved on the experimental side, obviously, and Cho Xin Yang and Andre Berning were theorists helping uh, to interpret the data. And so what this data is, uh, is again, spin relaxation time as a function of the couplings, spin orbit couplings. And what they were able to do is actually to change them. And they changed them, let's say, by biasing the system, by changing the symmetry of the well, or by changing the width of the well. So this asymmetry thing changes the Rushbrook coupling. It sort of gives you the different degree of broken mirror symmetry. So the well width gives you different reset house couplings. And all these data are fitted uh, are fit to, our curve, uh, to our theory, which was actually rather complicated theory. And we didn't even help them. You know, We didn't even know if you know, they were looking into it. And we were pleasantly surprised, I would say, to, to see that. So, uh, but uh, clearly it works. OK, so there are some concerns. People don't understand why, of course, because there should be some other mechanism, mechanisms for spin relaxation, such as magnetic impurities, and et cetera, et cetera. But at the basic level, I think it's pretty clear that the spin diffusion actually is the, is the mechanism uh, for you know, spin transport in the real materials, which I should study. Okay. Anyway, so this was the uh, uh, what we did. And also, recently, we published uh, another paper following up on that. Uh, and uh, it was done by mostly by my student Brian Anderson and former postdoc Peter Stanaslo. So um, basically, let me just give you the idea because it's still a, you know a theory kind of idea. So the uh, main um, experimental 
uh, way to measure spin pole effect or quantum spin pole effect to observe the topological insulator is to look at what happens at the edges of the sound. So that's actually where things happen. But uh, in fact, you don't really need the physical edge to, uh, to see an effect. You just need some kind of inhomogeneity uh, in your system. So if you have a way to produce inhomogeneity by something else, let's say by inducing a density wave or something else, you can equivalently see uh, manifestations of this, well, initially topological uh, properties. And so what we basically, what we did is uh, we looked at what happens if you inject uh, a strong, uh, let's say, uh, charge density wave into a spin orbit couple system, such that you can imagine basically, uh, you know, these points, there's many, many, many boundaries in the system that we introduced. And as a result of this, uh, of the introduction of this charge density wave, you will get spin accumulation up and down, which are basically the manifestation of this uh, spin pole effect. And I would say that, uh, so this is something which I think Jake Corralik and Jordan Sun are actually doing now, so they're trying to observe this effect. But also there is an interesting idea, this for those of you who are interested in topological insulators, that maybe in topological insulators something like that could be uh, done. Because uh, after all, in a topological insulator, the only observable thing to uh, care about is uh, boundary. So, uh, and it's, well, in principle, not universal and such. But if you could create something in the bulk, some strong homogeneity or density with in the bulk, it could also be to to observable effects. I get it, I did this. Is yeah. So how did they make the, the impose the, uh, the Potential here or so they, uh, actually, the effect works both ways. You can induce spin density wave and look for charge density wave in response. They can definitely produce spin density wave by so-called spin grading, so which I sort of mentioned before, but didn't describe in any detail. So it's an optical technique. With I, this. See. Uh, it's, uh, I think uh, the guy who actually developed the technique is, uh, his name is Gerrit, I think he's in MIT now, an assistant professor. It was in Joe Bernstein's group, and they developed this technique, and uh, it's very, been very successful. Uh, but they can do it. So I'm not sure about how. I get it. This is a driven system, right? You, you drive it. You want to sustain it. Yes. You yeah, want but to it's stationary state, but it's only clear state. Right. So if I, had a, yeah. Yeah. if I had a way to produce a static kind of sustaining wave like that, I would have been as happy as, you know, with the with you know, equilibrium thing, but I'm just not sure it's realistic. So although I know that they can actually do it, you know, with injecting spin density, but for instance, if you could, I don't know, buy some gate voltage modulation or something like that, produce, uh, you know, something, let's say, in a topological insulator, you probably would be also interested. So there are... Yeah, it's more than I can have it without it instead of that. And uh, I would have this perception that you always went into spin relaxation. So we would make a equilibrium state, the spin should disappear, right? Because in the, so if you don't sustain, sustain this thing, if you don't have a steady state. Energy, yeah. Energy, yeah. Some state and then yeah. you find it. Yeah, basically you need some sort of kinetic theory that you have some collision integral on the right that balances whatever energy you're yeah, pumping exactly. in, in the lab. And so you get a steady state, which may not be a very equilibrium state, but you know, it has this property. And the only message really here that I wanted to say, kind of general message, is that for these types of effects, which are topological in nature, may, it might be interesting to look at the bulk of the system by, you know, but to, in the presence of some, uh, you know, non-uniform non, non distribution, let's say, of spin of charge. Maybe two interesting effects. Now, let me actually spend maybe, I don't know, 15 minutes, if it's okay, by, about uh, how it's kind of completely changing gears. Uh, it's still spin orbit coupling is the word, but now I will show how it can be realized and, and has been realized actually in cold atom systems. So I think we were the ones who actually used the word spin orbit coupling, but the basic structure was uh, had been there before. So it's just people didn't realize that it's it maps on the spin orbit coupling. So how it works is uh, uh, as follows. So imagine you have uh, atoms, let's say in the trap, cold atoms, and they are multi-level particles. And so what can be done actually uh, by experimentalists, let's say in this system when you have three low-lying states and an excited state, so these states can be coupled to one another by uh, lasers. So what it means mathematically is that the Hamiltonian has this form. Okay, so you have some you know, basically electric field, you know, you have trans you induce transitions between one and zero, you know, two and zero, three and zero, zero being the excited state. And so this actually can be done quite easily. And what, what's interesting is that if you diagonalize this atom laser Hamiltonian, you will see that there are two so-called dark states. Basically, it's the uh, uh, diagonalization of this matrix in the 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, space. Dark states mean that there is no admixture of the state 0. 
So if you populate your particles only in these dark states, they will stay there. So they will never go into the other states because they have to go through the excited states and it costs a lot of energy and it actually is a, it takes a lot of time. You know? so basically, you can think about your system being just in the two states and these are my spins, essentially. So, well, not spin, spin up and spin down. You just call it spin up and you call it spin down. Although up and down doesn't, doesn't really have any uh, real space significance. Now, uh, why is it a uh, spin orbit couple system? Because, uh, well, to diagonalize this Hamiltonian, you need to apply a sort of unitary transform uh, in this 0, 1, 2, 3 space, which in the presence of these laser fields, which are waves, you know, is position dependent. And uh, apart from the atom laser part in the Hamiltonian, there are also kinetic energy term, which includes derivatives. So, uh, okay, just let's ignore the, uh, you know, symbols here so you can parameterize your lasers which couple, you know, different states, basically in some spherical coordinates, and uh, you can find explicitly the rotation which, you know, does the job and brings your system to a diagonal uh, uh, system with dark states, and you can find what the states are and how they are built out of the low-lying states. But the, the most important thing is that when you actually do this procedure of diagonalizing basically a standalone atom, you have to also diagonalize the kinetic energy, and you have U dagger, which depends on R, and U of R, and these U's are matrices. So when you uh, differentiate with respect to distance, you will produce some matrices in your Hamiltonian. And then you project everything onto this dark state, which basically would mean that as a result of this exercise, you will get a two, 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 two by two dimensional matrix uh, in the spin space, which is, you can call it spin orbit couple, system, and well, it much depends on the actual form of this use, uh, what kind of system you will get. And you can get, in fact, uh, Rajbrand, Dresden, House, and the combination of the two. So originally, actually, people called this thing on a billion gauge potential, which it is, because it's a matrix, and it depends on, you know, you can write it like that. But in fact, uh, those of you who might have been working on spin orbit couple systems, uh, know that, in fact, any spin orbit coupling can actually be written like that. So it is a non abelian gauge potential. Uh, not yes, wrong word, right? It's in a fixed frame. A is a physical field. Actually, first of all, I don't like it. Okay, that's the language that's it's actually like a used. It's parallel transport in a fixed frame. Right. But uh, the gauge potential, usually when I'm thinking about gauge field, I think about something which fluctuates. This one doesn't fluctuate. It's just a space. Gauge means it's gauge invariant, right? It's all gauge invariant. This, this is normal, right? Well, there is some gauge invariance. No, 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 it's fixed frame. Like, like in the. Uh, uh, for the little spin order coupling, like A is like the electric field when you look at these spatial components. Right, but formally, right. I mean, if you look at the Hamiltonian, you have... It's a parallel uh, transport. Yeah, right? yeah, the, yeah. the parallel transport part is, is really like that on this here. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, so this was what the language that was actually used and is used uh, in, you know, describing the systems. But you can just call it differently, which, you know, call it spin orbit couple, which it is. And you can show that there are specific rather doable schemes, which actually, again, has been done, have been done and demonstrated with force, that can produce this type of Hamiltonian, which is basically the Dresden House process plus Rajbo. Actually, it's much more difficult for the experimentalists to produce pure Rajbo, pure Dresden House. It's much easier for them to do an anisotropic system to produce. Okay. So now, uh, why is it interesting? Uh, so, um, Again, what the spin orbit coupling does, it splits the usual band into two bands. <coughs> and in the case of, that is actually realized in the experiment, Rush plus the is an anisotropic uh, band with two minima. In the case of a pure Rush, but it's actually a band with a minimum on a ring. When we're thinking about solids, what we're thinking about is filling up this band up to a certain terminal level with uh, electrons. But these guys actually can be bosons. And in, in, in the experiments that have been, you know, done, these are bosons. And the bosons don't have any spherical energy, they want to condense. And so in this case, they don't condense into zero momentum state, but they rather will condense into two states, and there is degeneracy built in. And you, you know that, you know, whenever you have a degeneracy, there is something interesting coming out of this. And uh, so this is basically, what well, this spin orbit couple of BECs that I was supposed to talk about in, in detail are uh, the physics of these bosons with effective spin one half and in the presence of spin orbit uh, and what happens to them. And so let me just spend maybe five minutes and I'll wrap up. So, <coughs> yeah, well, so this is uh, already mentioned. So you have a fermionic system you can consider, you can consider uh, bosons. And basically the question of interest is how they're going to be distributed. So how do you build the wave function, the many body wave function with <laughs> this spin orbit coupled uh, Bose-Einstein tendency? 
So, so far, all these band structures and such, these are, spin or, uh, these are single particle pictures. But what I want to understand is actually many body states of such a, of such a kind, when you have bosons with effective spin one half and these interactions. And also the traps. So, those two degenerate uh, points are district? A what? The district, they're not on a continuum. It depends. Uh, it depends on the Hamiltonian. If you are mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Hamiltonian that they so far can do, these are two separate points. It's anisotropic. Uh, if they were, be, if you were to be able to produce, you know, Rajba, pure Rajba, mm -hmm. you know, they would see a minimum on a ring. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's, it's still an open problem in my mind. Well, I, I had some slides on that, but I don't think it's been solved. How actually was that? Was actually condensation happens in in this in this case? And so there is actually some motivation to study spin on a couple of BCs, which in fact was realized by some funding agencies. Uh, um, so, well, there are some fundamental motivations. So first of all, if you look at the recent paper of Lega, so even to describe usual sp spinner was uh, actually condensates, he actually starts his equation one or equation two is, a, is a, an equation for many body wave function which you have um, orbital part and the spin part factorized. But if you have spin orbit coupling, it's just manifestly not so, even at the single particle level. So you, it's much more complicated. You have a state which is which have an, you know has an entangled orbital and spin parts. So that's the first thing. We don't really know the right the wave function. Now, also this uh, degeneracy, uh, you know, double degeneracy of the spectrum uh, makes um, the system sort of a cubic because you know if you, as I will maybe mention. Two minutes. So you basically have a state, uh, the left, left moving particles, right moving particles. These are your two states, and uh, there are some uh, conservation laws actually built in because uh, in the absence of the of the of the trap, you actually would have momentum would be conserved. Spin is not conserved, but momentum is conserved. So in fact, it is actually a promising qubit. And uh, another thing uh, is, uh, which actually uh, is something which uh, is being done now. Uh, uh, you might have heard about atomic interferometers, which are uh, devices that measure uh, acceleration of gravity uh, via sort of an elementary quantum mechanical effect. So you have two beams, you, you know, start beams from one point, or combine them later, and depending on the perturbation that they feel in between, they, you can measure phase, phase difference. And I think one of the experiments that was done is that they put this device in a car and drove from Washington to uh, Los Angeles, and the uh, difference, the error was less than a meter. So they can actually very carefully measure uh, acceleration, and you can imagine that for military people, it's very useful to have a GPS which doesn't want to connect to a satellite. Because this, you just have uh, basically, if you know x naught, uh, you know initial position, initial velocity, and you can measure acceleration in each particular moment of time. That's it. So this actually being done, uh, I'm sorry, it's being used in, in real, uh, in real, uh, in real life. So, but uh, those devices are big because you really want to interfere with things that you know propagate over large distances. However, if you have uh, a thing which is trapped, let's say, and have to, has two internal degrees of freedom, so it can be used, you know, to do interference in this internal state, and this is what uh, is also of great interest right now. Uh, in any case, so on the physical side, the question that uh, we wanted to address is what what is the ground state of this system? So, if you have interactions completely turned off. It's a hugely degenerate state because you can build the you can build a many body wave function by putting as many particles as you want in the left. Uh, let's say I will call these guys left movers and these right movers. It's not light liquid, but you know I can just call them this way. So I can put up the five particles here, three here. Since the energy is zero, uh, it doesn't really matter. I can do it like this or like this, and uh, you know I can have a, an arbitrary combination, linear combination of states, and it will give you uh, ground state. And the degeneracy is basically goes as n plus one fold, which is where n is the number of particles. It's not the case, of course, as the moment you turn on interactions, it lifts to this huge degeneracy and actually it reduces it back to double degeneracy. And we have done that, so, uh, well, I'm just going to mention that we have the interaction potential, which is essentially density density interaction in the uh, language of original electrons, that one, that one has to do all kinds of rotations to describe the things in terms of the. Uh, things that actually condense, and you can do the calculation at the Bogolyubov mean field level. So the result of this exercise is that you can find the energy as a function of uh, particles in the left well and right well, and the uh, so the result is that the minimum of energy is achieved when you either have no particles in, in a well, meaning here that it's actually momentum space well, or all particles in the well. 
So the energy minimum is a state, a so-called noon state, actually. Uh, noon because you have all n particles here, zero particles here, or the other way around, zero here and here. You can read it, it's going to say noon. And uh, um, so this is a, or a stranger cat, I don't know, depending on what you want to call it, but it's a many body state. Actually. In this, you maximize the interaction energy, don't you? No, actually, that's, uh, actually, Lev Pitaevsky was visiting uh, Maryland, and he said, oh, that's wrong. And it's wrong because I is know... It's attractive or repulsive interaction? It's, it's, it's repulsive. And let me explain you. So he said, well, I know that if I have a real space well, and I have a repulsive interaction, I would want to split the particles apart. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. But uh, the interaction is in real space. So particles want to be as far in real space from each other as possible. But this is a momentum space well, which is sort of dual to real space. So if you, want, if you have a repulsion in real space, you want to be as far as possible in, in real space, as close as possible in momentum space. So it's, it's basically reverse to one another. So if you have, let's say, a, a real space double well, and you put an attractive interactions in, actually the particles would want to condense into one state. So can you go back to the major element of the interaction? Uh, well, it's uh, rather complicated. Yeah, but if you put it there, you'll have the first two Bs, for example, with the same momentum, the last two is different momentum, right? Uh, so first of all, the interaction has to be written in terms of physical density, in terms of physical particles. So then actually to arrive to this effective description of, in terms of bands, we have to do all kinds of rotations. Because the Hamiltonian is not diagonal even. The, 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 the non-interacting part of the Hamiltonian is not diagonal in, the, in terms of the spin indices. So it's actually it's a calculation that you have to do. So I... So you have a point interaction. So, no, I... It has to be point. It's, a, it's, Bogalibov, it's the same level of calculation that you would do to okay. find Bogalibov modes in a... I, I, I can imagine, depending the uh, R dependency potential, that your argument uh, of keeping them separate in... Uh, well, yeah, you, you, you don't want, want Coulomb interaction, interaction probably yeah. or something like that. So, But uh, you don't want something which is singular and Q equals zero limit. Yeah. So that's what you don't want. But for any interaction that is sort of short range, I think it's right. So basically, well, you have some... It would be my interest. I think good argument for short range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for short range compared to something, there should be some energy scale. So you want it to be weak, because otherwise the Bogalibu theory breaks down. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, but I think this argument that we came up with after Pitayevsky, you know, expressed this concern, I think it's actually right. So that you basically, you, want, you get the result which is opposite to what you would have gotten in the, uh, for the real space double well. Mm. And so for, but, for, for such a wave yeah. function, can you expect the Type oscillations. You can expect all kinds of things. So I should mention that uh, Ian Spielman told me last week that he has observed this one. But let me also show you what has What's been... What's the momentum, total momentum of the left state and right state? They have different momentum, don't they? So, um... Because one of them is he says there's a total momentum is pointing left, the other one is pointing right. So it seems like you have a state where you have a current. Yes. So, uh, the the okay, one. let me actually show you. Skip over. So now, momentum, one has to be careful about momentum, about velocity here. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you, um, it's actually related to those spin hole effect type arguments in solids, you know. So, um, if you calculate dh over dp at this point, where you have the minimum, so energy is, is uh, energy bands are expressed in terms of kinetic momentum mm -hmm. here. But the velocity that you, think, you, know, you should think about in terms of particles moving left or right or currents moving actually are not P's, but V's, you know, okay. which are derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to momentum averaged in the ground state, in which case you can show it's zero. So the velocities are actually zero. And uh, so one interesting thing is, uh, okay, so one can, one can think whether it can exist as such, such, but what would be the actual hallmark of this BEC if it were to exist? So you would see several minima instead of one minimum. Right. So normally, how do you observe a BEC? Well, you have a, a single peak which corresponds to zero momentum. Well, you can actually calculate what would be the time of flight expansion of such a orbit coupled BEC. Well, normally you would expect to have two or more peaks because well, you have minus P and P. And uh, well, maybe I'm slightly confused. I mean, in many cases, go back to the cyclic right. So when you are in the orbit, <coughs> both clumps are at a standstill. Because you said the velocity is vanishing. So, actually, and now you switch off both. Uh, yeah. So you the need trap, and then it remembers that actually it has it also in a final momentum, and it starts to fly apart. 
actually to observe this, one has to turn off not only the trap, yeah. but also the spinorbic coupled fields that you that you use uh, and then to hook it up. Then yeah. the momentum becomes momentum. Yeah. And actually they fly apart. Yeah. Yeah. So if you turn off just the trap and not the spinorbic coupling, they would okay, you would yeah. probably see something else. But in fact it's experimentally easier to uh, you know cut off uh, both of them because in some sense they use uh, you know uh, these lasers to both trap things and, and use the spinorbic coupling. Let me actually show you the experiment because this is the experiment which I observed it. So uh, this was an experiment by actually done mostly by this human, but also it's uh, Bill Phillips, you know, uh, and, uh, Trey Porto and Ned at Nest at the Joint Quantum Institute. So they actually they basically produced a structure which is very similar to this, which is basically spinorbic coupled was ancient condensate. And so this is a picture from their PRL. So this part uh, is, uh, so this is basically the populations of particles with certain momenta measured by uh, time of flight. And you see there is a, an area in the region in, terms, in the parameter space where they get, so this red curve is actually the spectrum of the two, uh, you know, two minima. And so these two populations correspond to two, part, you know, two types of particles flying apart. So it has been seen. And moreover, uh, well, I'm also hoping to show you the data, but you didn't send it to me. So they actually have, have evidence that they really see a cat-like stage, because this just uh, shows you that there are two types of momenta present, but uh, it tells you nothing about the actual ground state. But you can actually do it. So this is, this is being done. Okay. Yeah, so in that regard, a question. Yeah, um, so this is a bit of an attitude that you make a superposition of big objects, right? Because you have all the particles here or there. And I would perhaps expect that the coherence of that thing is a bit delicate. How does that work in practice? I don't, so, uh, to tell you the truth, very little is known about this. So, the only thing which, uh, which I personally have done is uh, to figure out what the ground state, thing, uh, ground state wave function is. And where we have been looking also into the possibility of entangling those two things, like Joseph type phenomena. I, I guess one of the basic simple questions like, yes. you have this ground state, that where you'll have everything here or everything there. And there should be kind of an anti bonding state associated with it. And then you would like to know how this gap scales with n, with the number of particles in the trap. And the gap being uh, between the two wells? Right, because when you combine the. Now there should be an anti bonding part, right? Basically, say, I have certainly a cat set of this plus that. And there should also be an orthogonal state. Uh, uh, here, minus there. Well, no, I mean, and there's a gap, and it should scale with n, and it should tell you what the energy ah, okay, scale is. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So, uh, I see what you're saying. So, actually, it doesn't split at all. Interactions don't split uh, the degeneracy. It's exact at the menu by level. So, they lift the degeneracy only of this uh, kind of a huge degeneracy that I mentioned in non practices. So, you can put not only plus or minus here, you can put any complex number here with the only constraint that, you know, the, you know, this is the weight of the particles in the left well, and you create all the particles there, and this is the weight of the particles in the right well, you create all the particles there, and you can put any phase there, and you can have any combination of these numbers. It's the only constraint that they have to sum up to one. So you have an arbitrary phase, relative yes. phase? Yes. So that, that means you have a degeneracy. Yes. Which is the spin degeneracy of the original problem. So, oh, in, okay. is the, uh, so you have the problem which actually has so-called Kramer symmetry, which you would call actually Kramer symmetry in the spin orbit couple system. The only difference is that it's not kind of symmetry because this spin is not, you know, it's but not in the experiment region. they should fix it, right, in order to see the, the, the two states, because otherwise they'll mix them and they'll see nothing. I don't think that the time of flight experiments tells you a lot about phase coherence. It just tells you that you have a bunch of particles with no, certain No, but they, they should fix the, the, the direction, of, I mean the phase, you see, because otherwise they'll have a superposition of all phases. So probably, okay, I don't know what happens, the experiment doesn't know what happens, but likely, so this phase actually, unfortunately, may fluctuate strongly because it's sort of quantum conjugate to the number of particles. Well, you need the relevant yeah. phase. Yeah. So, uh, okay. if you have any so tunneling... Large n limit, yeah. uh, the phase would be infinitely fragile, so any kind of temperature would be destroyed. So, we are still hoping it's not completely the case, because it's not a real... Uh, uh, okay, let me actually show you. But really hard scales with n, right? So, we actually looked uh, at how robust is the genus, right? So, an interesting observation is that, first of all, everything is nice to formulate in momentum space, we have this double well, but in reality, you have a trap. So the trap is m omega squared r squared. So r is d or dp if you write it in uh, momentum space. So trap actually gives you a sort of kinetic energy in momentum space. 
So everything is reversed. So normally you would have, uh, you know, double well potential, real space, you would have a real mass of a particle, you know, there will be some tunneling events, etc., etc. So here, the only way you can tunnel is because of the presence of the trap. Because if you did have any trap, momentum would have been conserved. You can't really tunnel from left to right because it will break, you know, uh, momentum conservation law. So, but if you have a trap, you know, momentum is defined modular, you know, some trap, uh, uh, you know, momentum is here. So, this would be the relevant parameter which determines the splitting, uh, but uh, uh, at, the, at the mean field level, sort of, if, you, if your interactions don't break uh, spin symmetry uh, of the original problem, the degeneracy will be completely exact, and it's actually easy to see using the same arguments that uh, people use in solids when they invoke uh, primary degeneracy, basically. So I have a, I can write my gross Kutayevsky equation and hook up a symmetry which I call time reversal, even though it is not time reversal. I just say, well, there is a symmetry when p goes to minus p and sigma goes to minus sigma. And uh, the equations will be invariant under a certain transform and the energies will be exactly uh, the same. So this can be proved. It's a... Uh, uh, huh? Yeah. So it's basically telling that uh, you have now to include Hopf fluctuations and it's all lifted degeneracy. And the energy scale will surely scale as well over n. Mm -hmm. uh, right? Yes, yeah, so I think. I think and likely the scale is set by the trap. So I think that the question is, is whether the phase coherence between the wells is very robust. Probably no. But there is nothing which the experiment can measure at the moment. So the only thing we can say that you know such things exist in principle and that there should be two you know, condensates with different momentum. So there should be some sort of internal Josephson effect, all kinds of interesting th things, but it's just starting out. So there was one paper on that, and another one is being written by experimentalists. Okay, so and let me just skip the rest and conclude, and actually I have nothing to conclude. Uh, so the another interesting problem is Rajbla. We don't know the solution, uh, and there are some interesting things. And let me skip that. And do some, well, thank you, it's actually good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, a line of question. Um, yeah. So in this model with this artificial gauge field, um, so this gauge field has spatial dependence. The moment is still going to number in this case? In a trap. In no, a trap it's never going to find no, no, number. No, no, low trap, but you, are, you have this gauge field, but it has this spatial dependence in a single party level, right? Okay, so you can imagine different kinds of setups. Some of those setups reduce the spin orbit couple system, in which case momentum is a good quantum number. Uh -huh. So, uh, in some sense, uh, the spin orbit couple parameters are related to some derivatives over you know distance. So, if you have a linear uh, wave, essentially, that uh, yeah. uh, is related to the you know coupling between the uh, low lying state and excited state, so you would get a position independent. Uh, yeah, because I'm saying in some setup the the gauge field actually is equivalent to some magnetic field. Absolutely, so that's why uh, particular direction. there was a paper recently in Nature, two uniform. papers, when yeah. Spielman not... observed the vortices using this. Right, like, so like a non-uniform want... yeah. magnetic field, right? So, <laughs> so you can do both. So it's actually a very powerful scheme. So uh, I think the NIST group is mostly interested in uh, producing the quantum polyfield using uh, the fictitious, you know, this kind of crack, what do they call it? fictitious magnetic field or mm -hmm. synthetic a synthetic magnetic field. So they actually don't want any spin spin dependence. But in reality it's actually hard to avoid it because the scheme that is used sort of mm -hmm. has a metric structure built in. But but it would also <coughs> break the kind of spatial symmetry like rotation or maybe translation all in the same time. Because well they apply like lasers which yeah which yeah, you know, yeah. they have a wave essentially through the So in your harmony so the the rotational and the translational symmetry are still there. like the p momentum is still put upon a number to 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 describe the single particle state. So my Hamiltonian that I've studied uh, is a spin orbit coupled Hamiltonian, which do, uh, with linear spin orbit coupling, which does conserve momentum. So the mm -hmm. moment you put a trap, it's obviously no, so gone without spin orbit coupling. It's always the case. Mm -hmm. So they can actually do it. They can produce such a field. But there are other schemes in which it is not the case, and you do get uh, broken. Uh, well, you get magnetic field essentially, effectively magnetic field. And the way to see that was uh, to produce vortices without any rotation. So they had a BEC. Well, you probably know this. Right? So, uh, and, uh, so this is, I think, a pretty big thing. So maybe bigger than you know, the spin orbit thing. So th what I like about spin orbit is that it's new. You know, it doesn't map onto anything, actually, in solids. Uh, I, mean, I mean, to me, it's very really interesting to see, you know, you have this omega, which depends on R. But somehow, you know, the single particle Hamiltonian is still 
preserve the momentum is good kind of number. So maybe that gives some stretch oh, arrangement true. of omega of r. That's key. It cannot be true. Yeah. I mean, that's what's the. Uh, well, I, but I mean, when you put it into the into in the form of the gauge field, so uh, there is some R dependence, yeah. which will be gone after you differentiate and produce back, you know, the. Uh, uh, it's just a way to write it. You can write it as specifically as p squared over 2m plus, you know, p plus so, c. So in the case you have sorry about you, uh, yeah. if I take your a, if I say del cross a, the b is zero in your case? Yes, in my case I want it to be zero. Okay, so, so it was actually, because we have to look for, for a scheme in uh -huh. which it is zero. In mm -hmm. principle, it's much easier to produce a crazy scheme which you have both spin orbit and magnetic fields, it's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, but, it, you know, maybe it's also interesting. Mm -hmm. But we have a look. Yeah, it's a sort of, I guess we let it see. I mean, we fought around with sort of a very similar uh, uh, theme some time ago. This is a whole different angle. So we basically started out observing that when you spin orbit coupling, you'll have these spin currents, and these spin currents uh, basically will buy an SU2 uh, type of kind of middle parallel transport structure. I look at it just as high energy physicist. So uh, which one was that? Well, uh, it's just why I used to orbit have a time you don't be prejudiced that your fields point in a particular direction. Okay. Right? And that is very general that you have an actual two type parallel uh, transport structure when you take crash bar, it simplifies to the fact that you want. But the general case is your two. Right? But, but it's not no fluctuating, so for high energy you're no, yeah, no, 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 these these gauge fields right. are like combinations of electrical and magnetic fields. Right, and they're fixed frame, so it's not a young build theory with full flow, but the parallel transport structure is that of an issue to normal building and wheels. Well, you, you, you now you can get continue, to. Let, me, let me argue. I mean, we were yeah. I, I can give you the reference. Now you can basically say, okay, uh, I am uh, sort of not worried about mm -hmm. how I, I exactly make it, but I'm basically with some causal system seeing this parallel transport structure. And as uh, Gisborg and Landau guessed, the Gisborg Landau functional, it has to be. That is parallel transport structure is remembered by the order parameter. Mm -hmm. Now, what you basically then get is a uh, 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 non abelian uh, Higgs, which is like standard model Higgs mechanism, mm -hmm. except that the gauge fields are not a uh, real gauge field, they're fixed frame. Mm -hmm. But you can still play all the games using uh, what you know from your mill series about the topology and so forth. Now this looks actually very different from your construction which you show in a cat state. Right? That is basically like you have a order parameter which is non abelian and X field is non abelian. Um, yeah, but there is no so. electromagnetic depth, so you should, you know, if field gives mass to a gauge field, right? Yeah, so but the only one is really a gauge field, right? And in no way uh, this spin orbit affects gauge field. Can Higgs electromagnetic field? But there's no mass effect associated with the uh, neural electric dynamics. Okay, so it's just that matter that gets transported, I mean, these right. are all exact right, statements, right? right? right. No, so the matter is transported as yes. if there is a gauge field, but the gauge field field actually corresponds with a physical configuration of electromagnetic fields. Right. Right? Yeah. But then you can play games, mm -hmm. and we figured out, I can tell you that in private. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and basically like uh, that we now, yeah, let, let me tell you that in the Python. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but then just the uh, last thing to mention along these lines, I think it's a very interesting perspective to try to produce something uh, which is relevant to high energy, because I think you might actually be able to make these fields feel fluctuate, because these structures can be made dynamic. No, you, cannot gauge, uh, hmm? you cannot gauge You probably cannot gauge them, but you, no, can, you, 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 can, you can look at the, but, but it's not gauge, it has nothing to do with high energy physics. I mean, gauge energy So if you have a stochastic type, a stochastic uh, gauge field. It's just tall. It's tall. There's this whole business with emerging gauge fields, hobby of mine, and uh, you gauge okay. or you don't gauge, and there's really no middle way there. Well, I'm just saying, we don't look the same. Yeah, maybe you maybe have still part of it. Right? Right. Parallel transport structure by itself is very interesting, and part of the agenda of gauge right. fields. Don't push it too little, but I guess that's what I truly agree.